Book Seventh, Chapter One of the Ambassadors by Henry James. It wasn't the first time Strether had sat alone in the great dim church. Still less was it the first of his giving himself up, so far as conditions permitted, to its beneficent action on his nerves. He had been to Notre Dame with Waymarsh, he had been there with Miss Gostrey, he had been there with Chad Newsome, and had found the place, even in company, such a refuge from the obsession of his problem, that with renewed pressure from that source he had not unnaturally recurred to a remedy meeting the case, for the moment, so indirectly, no doubt, but so relievingly. He was conscious enough that it was only for the moment, but good moments, if he could call them good, still had their value for a man who by this time struck himself as living almost disgracefully from hand to mouth. Having so well learnt the way, he had lately made the pilgrimage more than once by himself, had quite stolen off, taking an unnoticed chance, and making no point of speaking of the adventure when restored to his friends. His great friend, for that matter, was still absent, as well as remarkably silent. Even at the end of three weeks Miss Gostrey hadn't come back. She wrote to him from Mentone, admitting that he must judge her grossly inconsequent, perhaps in fact for the time odiously faithless, but asking for patience, for a deferred sentence, throwing herself in short on his generosity. For her, too, she could assure him, life was complicated, more complicated than he could have guessed. She had, moreover, made certain of him, certain of not wholly missing him on her return, before her disappearance. If, furthermore, she didn't burden him with letters, it was frankly because of her sense of the other great commerce he had to carry on. He himself, at the end of a fortnight, had written twice, to show how his generosity could be trusted. But he reminded himself in each case of Mrs. Newsome's epistolary manner, at the times when Mrs. Newsome kept off delicate ground. He sank his problem, he talked of Waymarsh and Miss Barras, of little Bilham and the set over the river, with whom he had again had tea, and he was easy for convenience about Chad and Madame de Vionnet and Jeanne. He admitted that he continued to see them. He was decidedly so confirmed a haunter of Chad's premises, and that young man's practical intimacy with them was so undeniably great but he had his reason for not attempting to render for Miss Gostrey's benefit the impression of these last days. That would be to tell her too much about himself, it being at present just from himself he was trying to escape. This small struggle sprang not a little in its way from the same impulse that had now carried him across to Notre Dame, the impulse to let things be, to give them time to justify themselves, or at least to pass. He was aware of having no errand in such a place, but the desire not to be, for the hour, in certain other places, a sense of safety, of simplification, which each time he yielded to it he amused himself by thinking of as a private concession to cowardice. The great church had no altar for his worship, no direct voice for his soul, but it was none the less soothing even to sanctity, for he could feel while there what he couldn't elsewhere, that he was a plain, tired man taking the holiday he had earned. He was tired, but he wasn't plain. That was the pity and the trouble of it. He was able, however, to drop his problem at the door very much as if it had been the copper piece that he deposited on the threshold in the receptacle of the inveterate blind beggar. He trod the long dim nave, sat in the splendid choir, paused before the cluttered chapels of the East End, and the mighty monument laid upon him its spell. He might have been a student under the charm of a museum, which was exactly what, in a foreign town, in the afternoon of life, he would have liked to be free to be. This form of sacrifice did at any rate for the occasion as well as another. It made him quite sufficiently understand how, within the precinct, for the real refugee, the things of the world could fall into abeyance. That was the cowardice, probably, to dodge them, to beg the question, not to deal with it in the hard outer light, but his own oblivions were too brief, too vain, to hurt any one but himself, 
and he had a vague and fanciful kindness for certain persons whom he met, figures of mystery and anxiety, and whom, with observation for his pastime, he ranked as those who were fleeing from justice. Justice was outside, in the hard light, and injustice too, but one was as absent as the other from the air of the long aisles and the brightness of many altars. Thus it was, at all events, that one morning, some dozen days after the dinner in the boulevard Malherbe, at which Madame de Vionnet had been present with her daughter, he was called upon to play his part in an encounter that deeply stirred his imagination. He had the habit, in these contemplations, of watching a fellow visitant, here and there, from a respectable distance, remarking some note of behaviour, of penitence, of prostration, of the absolved, relieved state. This was the manner in which his vague tenderness took its course, the degree of demonstration to which it naturally had to confine itself. It hadn't indeed so felt its responsibility, as when on this occasion he suddenly measured the suggestive effect of a lady whose supreme stillness, in the shade of one of the chapels, he had two or three times noticed as he made, and made once more, his slow circuit. She wasn't prostrate, not in any degree bowed, but she was strangely fixed, and her prolonged immobility showed her, while he passed and paused, as wholly given up to the need, whatever it was, that had brought her there. She only sat and gazed before her, as he himself often sat, but she had placed herself, as he never did, within the focus of the shrine, and she had lost herself, he could easily see, as he would only have liked to do. She was not a wandering alien, keeping back more than she gave, but one of the familiar, the intimate, the fortunate, for whom these dealings had a method and a meaning. She reminded our friend, since it was the way of nine-tenths of his current impressions to act as recalls of things imagined, of some fine, firm, concentrated heroine of an old story, something he had heard, read, something that, had he had a hand for drama, he might himself have written, renewing her courage, renewing her clearness, in splendidly protected meditation. Her back, as she sat, was turned to him, but his impression absolutely required that she should be young and interesting, and she carried her head, moreover, even in the sacred shade, with a discernible faith in herself, a kind of implied conviction of consistency, security, impunity. But what had such a woman come for if she hadn't come to pray? Strether's reading of such matters was, it must be owned, confused. But he wondered if her attitude was some congruous fruit of absolution, of indulgence. He knew but dimly what indulgence in such a place might mean. Yet he had, as with a soft sweep, a vision of how it might indeed add to the zest of active rites. All this was a good deal to have been denoted by a mere lurking figure who was nothing to him. But the last thing before leaving the church, he had the surprise of a still deeper quickening. He had dropped upon a seat halfway down the nave, and again in the museum mood was trying with head thrown back and eyes aloft, to reconstitute a past, to reduce it in fact to the convenient terms of Victor Hugo, whom a few days before, giving the rein for once in a way to the joy of life, he had purchased in seventy bound volumes a miracle of cheapness, parted with, he was assured by the shopman, at the price of the red and gold alone. He looked, doubtless, while he played his eternal nippers over Gothic glooms, sufficiently wrapped in reverence, but what his thought had finally bumped against was the question of where, among packed accumulations, so multiform a wedge would be able to enter. Were seventy volumes in red and gold to be perhaps what he should most substantially have to show at Woollett, as the fruit of his mission? It was a possibility that held him a minute, held him till he happened to feel that some one, unnoticed, had approached him and paused. Turning, he saw that a lady stood there, as for a greeting, and he sprang up as he next took her, securely, from Madame de Vionnet, who happened to have recognised him as she passed near him on her way to the door. She checked, quickly and gaily, a certain confusion in him, came to meet it, turned it back by an art of her own, the confusion having threatened him as he knew her for the person he had lately been observing. 
She was the lurking figure of the dim chapel. She had occupied him more than she guessed, but it came to him in time, luckily, that he needn't tell her, and that no harm, after all, had been done. She herself, for that matter, straightway showing she felt their encounter as the happiest of accidents, had for him a, you come here too, that despoiled surprise of every awkwardness. I come often, she said, I love this place, but I'm terrible in general for churches. The old women who live in them all know me. In fact, I'm already myself one of the old women. It's like that at all events that I foresee I shall end looking about for a chair, so that he instantly pulled one nearer, she sat down with him again to the sound of an, "'Oh, I like so much your also being fond.' He confessed the extent of his feeling, though she left the object vague, and he was struck with the tact, the taste of her vagueness, which simply took for granted in him a sense of beautiful things. He was conscious of how much it was affected, this sense, by something subdued and discreet in the way she had arranged herself for her special object and her morning walk. He believed her to have come on foot, the way her slightly thicker veil was drawn, a mere touch, but everything, the composed gravity of her dress, in which here and there a dull wine-colour seemed to gleam faintly through black, the charming discretion of her small compact head the quiet note as she sat of her folded grey-gloved hands it was to strether's mind as if she sat on her own ground the light honours of which at an open gate she thus easily did him while all the vastness and mystery of the domain stretched off behind when people were so completely in possession they could be extraordinarily civil and our friend had indeed at this hour a kind of revelation of her heritage she was romantic for him far beyond what she could have guessed, and again he found his small comfort in the conviction that, subtle though she was, his impression must remain a secret from her. The thing that once more made him uneasy for secrets in general was this particular patience she could have with his own want of colour, albeit that on the other hand his uneasiness pretty well dropped, after he had been for ten minutes as colourless as possible, and at the same time as responsive. The moments had already, for that matter, drawn their deepest tinge from the special interest excited in him by his vision of his companion's identity with the person whose attitude before the glimmering altar had so impressed him. This attitude fitted admirably into the stand he had privately taken about her connection with Chad on the last occasion of his seeing them together. It helped him to stick fast at the point he had then reached. It was there he had resolved that he would stick, and at no moment since had it seemed as easy to do so. Unassailably innocent was a relation that could make one of the parties to it so carry herself. If it wasn't innocent, why did she haunt the churches? Into which, given the woman he could believe he had made out, she would never have come to flaunt an insolence of guilt. She haunted them for continued help, for strength, for peace, sublime support which, if one were able to look at it so, she found from day to day. They talked in low easy tones, and with lifted lingering looks, about the great monument and its history and its beauty, all of which Madame de Vionnet professed came to her most in the other, the outer view. "'We'll presently, after we go,' she said, walk around it again if you like. I'm not in a particular hurry, and it will be pleasant to look at it well with you." He had spoken of the great romancer and the great romance, and of what, to his imagination, they had done for the whole, mentioning to her, moreover, the exorbitance of his purchase, the seventy blazing volumes that were so out of proportion. Out of proportion to what? Well, to any other plunge. Yet he felt, even as he spoke, how at that instant he was plunging. He had made up his mind and was impatient to get into the air, for his purpose was a purpose to be uttered outside, and he had a fear that it might with delay still slip away from him. She, however, took her time. She drew out their quiet gossip, as if she had wished to profit by their meeting, and this confirmed precisely an interpretation of her manner, of her mystery while she rose, as he would have called it, to the question of Victor Hugo, her voice itself, the light low quaver of her deference to the solemnity about them, 
seemed to make her words mean something that they didn't mean openly. Help, strength, peace, a sublime support. She hadn't found so much of these things as that the amount wouldn't be sensibly greater for any scrap his appearance of faith in her might enable her to feel in her hand. Every little in a long strain helped, and if he happened to affect her as a firm object she could hold on by, he wouldn't jerk himself out of her reach. People in difficulties held on by what was nearest, and he was, perhaps, after all, not further off than sources of comfort more abstract. It was as to this he had made up his mind. He had made it up, that is, to give her a sign. The sign would be that, though it was her own affair, he understood. The sign would be that, though it was her own affair, she was free to clutch. Since she took him for a firm object, much as he might to his own sense appear at times to rock, he would do his best to be one. The end of it was that half an hour later they were seated together for an early luncheon at a wonderful, a delightful house of entertainment on the left bank, a place of pilgrimage for the knowing they were both aware, the knowing who came, for its great renown, the homage of restless days, from the other end of the town. Strether had already been there three times, first with Miss Gostrey, then with Chad, then with Chad again and with Waymarsh and little Bilham, all of whom he had himself sagaciously entertained, and his pleasure was deep now on learning that Madame de Vionnet hadn't yet been initiated. When he had said, as they strolled round the church by the river, acting at last on what within he had made up his mind to, "'Will you, if you have time, come to déjeuner with me somewhere? For instance, if you know it, over there on the other side, which is so easy a walk,' and then had named the place. When he had done this she stopped short, as for quick intensity and yet deep difficulty of response. She took in the proposal, as if it were almost too charming to be true, and there had perhaps never yet been for her companion so unexpected a moment of pride, so fine, so odd a case at any rate, as his finding himself thus able to offer to a person in such universal possession a new, rare amusement. She had heard of the happy spot, but she asked him in reply to a further question how in the world he could suppose her to have been there. He supposed himself to have supposed that Chad might have taken her, and she guessed this the next moment to his no small discomfort. "'Ah, let me explain,' she smiled, "'that I don't go about with him in public. I never have such chances, not having them otherwise, and it's just the sort of thing that, as a quiet creature living in my hole, I adore.' It was more than kind of him to have thought of it, though, frankly, if he asked whether she had time, she hadn't a single minute. That, however, made no difference. She'd throw everything over, every duty at home, domestic, maternal, social, awaited her. But it was a case for a high line. Her affairs would go to smash, but hadn't one a right to one snatch of scandal when one was prepared to pay? It was on this pleasant basis of costly disorder, consequently, that they eventually seated themselves, on either side of a small table, at a window adjusted to the busy quay and the shining barge-burdened seine, where, for an hour, in the matter of letting himself go, of diving deep, Strether was to feel he had touched bottom. He was to feel many things on this occasion, and one of the first of them was that he had travelled far since that evening in London, before the theatre, when his dinner with Maria Gostrey, between the pink-shaded candles, had struck him as requiring so many explanations. He had at that time gathered them in, the explanations. He had stored them up. But it was at present as if he had either soared above or sunk below them, he couldn't tell which. He could somehow think of none that didn't seem to leave the appearance of collapse and cynicism easier for him than lucidity. How could he wish it to be lucid for others, for any one, that he, for the hour, saw reasons enough in the mere way the bright, clean, ordered waterside life came in at the open window, the mere way Madame de Vionnet, opposite him over their intensely white table linen, their omelette aux tomates, their bottle of straw-coloured Chablis, thanked him for everything almost with the smile of a child. 
while her grey eyes moved in and out of their talk, back to the quarter of the warm spring air in which early summer had already begun to throb, and then back again to his face and their human questions. Their human questions became many before they had done, many more, as one after the other came up than our friend's free fancy had at all foreseen. The sense he had had before, the sense that he had had repeatedly, the sense that the situation was running away with him, had never been so sharp as now, and all the more that he could perfectly put his finger on the moment it had taken the bit in its teeth. That accident had definitely occurred the other evening, after Chad's dinner. It had occurred, as he fully knew, at the moment when he interposed between this lady and her child, when he suffered himself so to discuss with her a matter closely concerning them that her own subtlety, marked by its significant thank you, instantly sealed the occasion in her favour. Again he had held off for ten days, but the situation had continued out of hand in spite of that, the fact that it was running so fast being indeed just why he had held off. What had come over him, as he recognised her in the nave of the church, was that holding off could be but a losing game from the instant she was worked for not only by her subtlety, but by the hand of fate itself. If all the accidents were to fight on her side, and by the actual showing they loomed large, he could only give himself up. This was what he had done in privately deciding then and there to propose she should breakfast with him. What did the success of his proposal in fact resemble, but the smash in which a regular runaway properly ends? The smash was their walk, their déjeuner, their omelette, the chablis, the place, the view, their present talk and his present pleasure in it, to say nothing, wonder of wonders, of her own. To this tune, and nothing less accordingly, was his surrender made good. It sufficiently lighted up at least the folly of holding off. Ancient proverbs sounded for his memory, in the tone of their words, and the clink of their glasses, in the hum of the town, and the plash of the river. It was clearly better to suffer as a sheep than as a lamb. One might as well perish by the sword as by famine. Maria still away? That was the first thing she had asked him, and when he had found the frankness to be cheerful about it in spite of the meaning he knew her to attach to Miss Gostrey's absence, she had gone on to inquire if he didn't tremendously miss her. There were reasons that made him by no means sure, yet he nevertheless answered, tremendously, which she took in as if it were all she had wished to prove. Then— a man in trouble must be possessed somehow of a woman, she said. If she doesn't come in one way, she comes in another. Why do you call me a man in trouble? Ah, because that's the way you strike me. She spoke ever so gently, and as if with all fear of wounding him while he sat partaking of his bounty. Aren't you in trouble? He felt himself colour at the question, and then hated that hated to pass for anything so idiotic as woundable, woundable by Chad's lady, in respect to whom he had come out with such a fund of indifference, was he already at that point? Perversely, none the less, his pause gave a strange air of truth to her supposition, and what was he, in fact, but disconcerted at having struck her just in the way he had most dreamed of not doing? "'I'm not in trouble yet,' he at last smiled. I'm not in trouble now. Well, I'm always so. But that you sufficiently know. She was a woman who, between courses, could be graceful with her elbows on the table. It was a posture unknown to Mrs. Newsome, but it was easy for a femme du monde. Yes, I am now. There was a question you put to me, he presently returned, the night of Chad's dinner. I didn't answer it then, and it has been very handsome of you not to have sought an occasion for pressing me about it since. She was instantly all there. Of course I know what you allude to. I asked you what you had meant by saying, the day you came to see me, just before you left me, that you'd save me. And you then said, at our friends, that you'd have really to wait to see for yourself what you did mean. Yes, I asked for time, said Strether. And it sounds now, as you put it, like a very ridiculous speech. 
Oh, she murmured, she was full of attenuation. But she had another thought. If it does sound ridiculous, why do you deny that you're in trouble? Ah, if I were, he replied, it wouldn't be the trouble of fearing ridicule. I don't fear it. What then do you? Nothing, now. And he leaned back in his chair. I like your now, she laughed across at him. Well, it's precisely that it fully comes to me at present that I've kept you long enough. I know by this time at any rate what I meant by my speech, and I really knew it the night of Chad's dinner. Then why didn't you tell me? Because it was difficult at the moment. I had already at that moment done something for you, in the sense of what I had said the day I went to see you. But I wasn't then sure of the importance I might represent this as having. She was all eagerness. And you're sure now? Yes, I see that practically I've done for you, had done for you when you put me your question, all that it's as yet possible for me to do. I feel now, he went on, that it may go further than I thought. What I did after my visit to you, he explained, was to write straight off to Mrs. Newsome about you, and I'm at last, from one day to the other, expecting her answer. It's this answer that will represent, as I believe, the consequences. Patient and beautiful was her interest. I see, the consequences of your speaking for me. And she waited as if not to hustle him. He acknowledged it by immediately going on. The question, you understand, was how I should save you. Well, I'm trying it by thus letting her know that I consider you worth saving. I see, I see. Her eagerness broke through. How can I thank you enough? He couldn't tell her that, however, and she quickly pursued. You do really for yourself consider it? His only answer at first was to help her to the dish that had been freshly put before them. I've written to her again since then. I've left her in no doubt of what to think. I've told her all about you. Thanks, not so much. All about me, she went on, yes. All it seems to me you've done for him. Ah, and you might have added all it seems to me. She laughed again while she took up her knife and fork, as in the cheer of these assurances. But you're not sure how she will take it? No, I'll not pretend I'm sure. Voila! And she waited a moment. I wish you'd tell me about her. Oh, said Strether, with a slightly strained smile, all that need concern you about her is that she's really a grand person. Madame de Vionnet seemed to demur. Is that all that need concern me about her? But Strether neglected the question. Hasn't Chad talked to you? Of his mother, yes, a great deal, immensely, but not from your point of view. He can't, our friend returned, have said any ill of her. Not the least bit. He has given me, like you, the assurance that she's really grand. But her being really grand is somehow just what hasn't seemed to simplify our case. Nothing, she continued, is further from me than to wish to say a word against her. But of course I feel how little she can like being told of her owing me anything. No woman ever enjoys such an obligation to another woman. This was a proposition Strether couldn't contradict. And yet what other way could I have expressed to her what I felt? It's what there was most to say about you. Do you mean, then, that she will be good to me? It's what I'm waiting to see. But I've little doubt she would, he added, if she could comfortably see you. It seemed to strike her as a happy, a beneficent thought. Oh, then couldn't that be managed? Wouldn't she come out? Wouldn't she, if you so put it to her? Did you by any possibility? She faintly quavered. Oh, no, he was prompt. Not that. It would be much more to give an account of you that, since there's no question of your paying the visit, I should go home first. It instantly made her graver. And are you thinking of that? Oh, all the while, naturally. Stay with us, stay with us, she exclaimed on this. That's your only way to make sure. To make sure of what? Why, that he doesn't break up. You didn't come out to do that to him. Doesn't it depend, Strether returned after a moment, on what you mean by breaking up? Oh, you know well enough what I mean. 
His silence seemed again for a little to denote an understanding. "'You take for granted remarkable things.' "'Yes, I do, to the extent that I don't take for granted vulgar ones. You're perfectly capable of seeing that what you came out for wasn't really at all to do what you now have to do.' "'Ah, it's perfectly simple,' Strether good-humouredly pleaded. "'I've had but one thing to do, to put our case before him, to put it as it could only be put here on the spot, by personal pressure. My dear lady,' he lucidly pursued, my work, you see, is really done, and my reasons for staying on even another day are none of the best. Chad's in possession of our case, and professes to do it full justice. What remains is with himself. I've had my rest, my amusement and refreshment. I've had, as we say at Woollett, a lovely time. Nothing in it has been more lovely than this happy meeting with you, in these fantastic conditions to which you so delightfully consented. I've a sense of success. It's what I wanted. My getting all this good is what Chad has waited for, and I gather that if I'm ready to go, he's the same." She shook her head with a finer, deeper wisdom. "'You're not ready. If you're ready, why did you write to Mrs. Newsome, in the sense you've mentioned to me?' Strether considered. "'I shan't go before I hear from her. You're too much afraid of her,' he added. It produced between them a long look from which neither shrank. "'I don't think you believe that, believe I've not really reason to fear her.' "'She's capable of great generosity,' Strether presently stated. "'Well, then let her trust me a little, that's all I ask. Let her recognize, in spite of everything, what I've done.' "'Ah, remember,' our friend replied, "'that she can't effectually recognize it without seeing it for herself.' Let Chad go over and show her what you've done, and let him plead with her there for it, and, as it were, for you." She measured the depth of this suggestion. "'Do you give me your word of honour that if she once has him there, she won't do her best to marry him?' It made her companion, this inquiry, look again a while out of the view, after which she spoke without sharpness. "'When she sees for herself what he is—' But she had already broken in. It's when she sees for herself what he is that she'll want to marry him most." Strether's attitude, that of due deference to what she said, permitted him to attend for a minute to his luncheon. I doubt if that will come off. It won't be easy to make it. It will be easy if he remains there, and he'll remain for the money. The money appears to be, as a probability, so hideously much. Well, Strether presently concluded, Nothing could really hurt you but his marrying." She gave a strange light laugh. Putting aside what may really hurt him. But her friend looked at her as if he had thought of that too. The question will come up, of course, of the future that you yourself offer him. She was leaning back now, but she fully faced him. Well, let it come up. The point is that it's for Chad to make of it what he can. His being proof against marriage will show what he does make. If he is proof, yes, she accepted the proposition. But for myself, she added, the question is what you make. Ah, I make nothing. It's not my affair. I beg your pardon. It's just there that, since you've taken it up and are committed to it, it most intensely becomes yours. You're not saving me, I take it, for your interest in myself, but for your interest in our friend the ones at any rate wholly dependent on the other. You can't in honour not see me through, she wound up, because you can't in honour not see him." Strange and beautiful to him was her quiet, soft acuteness. The thing that most moved him was really that she was so deeply serious. She had none of the portentous forms of it, but he had never come in contact, it struck him, with a force brought to so fine a head. Mrs. Newsome, goodness knew, was serious, but it was nothing to this. He took it all in, he saw it all together. No, he mused, I can't in honour not see him. Her face affected him as with an exquisite light. You will, then? I will. At this she pushed back her chair and was the next moment on her feet. 
"'Thank you,' she said, with her hand held out to him across the table, and with no less a meaning in the words than her lips had so particularly given them after Chad's dinner. The golden nail she had then driven in pierced a good inch deeper. Yet he reflected that he himself had only meanwhile done what he had made up his mind to do on the same occasion. So far as the essence of the matter went, he had simply stood fast on the spot on which he had then planted his feet. End of Book Seventh, Chapter One